For a majority of my adult life, I worked in tech and IT. And during that time, I saw hundreds of millions of dollars spent on solutions, software and hardware that are no longer in existence. And some of those solutions that did last didn't work all that well. Now that I've immersed myself into the automotive space, within 10 to 15 years, almost every single new car will be connected to the internet, cloud-based infrastructure and data centers, and connected car platforms. Future vehicles will become rolling test beds for software design that control electromechanical systems, network topology, all the things that you see in a typical IT infrastructure, from firewalls to wide area networks to local area networks and much more. And with the help of Toyota and Microsoft, I'm going to try to explain and tell this story of how all of this works, how it's designed and where it's going in the future. Now, before we get started, I need to cover some terminology so you don't get lost. In the modern era, humans have been interacting with machines, and the study of that is typically called HMI or HCI, or Human Machine Interface or Human Computer Interface. And it's the study of how we interact as humans with computers and even industrial equipment. Now, as time has gone on, that focus has shifted with the way that we interact with screens or computers, keyboards, and mice. And that terminology has slowly changed into UI or UX design, which is user interface or user experience, and how we interact with those screens or interfaces. Now, in the automobile, it gets a little bit more complicated and sometimes needlessly because every manufacturer wants to put their own branding on it. The catch-all term is multimedia or infotainment, but companies like BMW brand it iDrive or Audi MMI or Kia Uvo. Really, when you boil it all down, it goes back to the essentials. It's all of that study of the human-machine interface or user experience that they're all trying to master. Now, regardless of your age, you've probably used a smartphone or tablet and understand how to navigate around that device. And the big question is, why is it that automotive manufacturers have been unable to replicate that experience on the inside part of the car? And the truth is, most of these companies existed long before all this technology did that we take for granted. They are rooted in a long line of suppliers, design, and certain ways they've done things in the past. Now, that's completely opposite with upstarts or new companies like Tesla or Rivian, who are really tech companies first or tech focused first and car manufacturers second. That's something that Toyota, GM, Ford, VW, they've always been car manufacturers and they've now had to retrofit and figure out a way to add modern technology in cars that didn't exist before. Now, in this video, it's going to focus on Toyota's story. It was an optimal opportunity to talk with them as they had to create a brand new technology solution from the ground up. This is quite rare in modern history for an automotive manufacturer. So some of the information is going to be skewed towards their experience, their story, and the way they've implemented technology. But a lot of the core pieces from security, network security, user privacy, networking, and of course, cloud-based infrastructure is going to apply for almost every single manufacturer going forward. So this all started when within North America, we, we saw an increasing need based on customer complaints that the technology in our vehicles wasn't, wasn't adequate for what they wanted. What happened was I was part of that discussion and I made a proposal to say, we th I think we have an idea. I think we have an option to, to fix this, um, but it's going to take a big change. We're going to have to bring some organizations together. We're going to have to change the way we work and we're going to have to take on responsibility that, that uh, normally we would never have taken on and is traditionally done in Japan. And so it was a bold proposal to say, these are all the things that we want to do. And which is amazing in Toyota is that things like this can happen. And the executive leadership said, okay, let's do it. And the one question, I remember the CEO at that time was Jim Lenz. The one question he, the only question he asked was, are you sure you can do this? 
And I was like, yes, we can definitely do this. And the reason I'm so sure of that was uh, we're completely obsessed by the user experience. We're so passionate about the fact that we know we can do this better and we know that we can, we can improve the way the customer interacts with technology in the vehicle. And as long as you have that passion, um, technology can fix anything. So that's why I knew we could do it. I knew we had the passion. I knew we would get the people. We had a lot of the people. Um, and so that's, that's really how it all started. Hi, my name is Ahmad Zahid, multimedia design engineer here at Toyota. Yeah, I mean, so I guess any great product, right, it always starts with the concept, the idea, the, the spur of the moment, the firework, the light bulb moment. And, and for us, right, that was really, that really came through with our leadership, having that vision of creating that unified product. Everyone across the company knew what needed to be done. You'd go home and you'd hear your, your parents, your cousins, everybody drives Toyotas and Lexuses. We all knew there was something wrong. There was something that needed to be done. The concept was very clear. But as a product, you go from concept, you go from concept to the creation of a product image, right? In which this is a bit more requirement driven from an engineering standpoint. Once you've got concept, you've got your collaboration across the teams, you really start to dig into the meat and potatoes of the development. You start creating what that vision was and rubber hits the road. Infotainment, multimedia, in vehicle technology, end of the day what it comes down to is the in-cabin interface to the customer. And then within that display, the beauty of the simplified user experience that comes with our HMI. The, the combination of iconography and placement and the performance tuning that came with that as well, right? Not just offering a simple unified, uh, simplified solution, but being able to make it perform in a dynamic way, considering half of it's in the cloud, the other half's embedded, and marrying the two halves. So a lot of the times, at least in the industry, one of the things that we've seen, right, is, is, is tech companies will always attack the lowest common denominator. They'll, they'll always try to iterate and over-design things um, simply for the sake of just it being a tech symposium, a showcase, right, uh, a tour de force, if you will. And, and for us, it really was less about that and more about let's just take care of the simple stuff, right? Um, when people are going 60 miles an hour, they don't have time to go and personalize ambient lighting. So why are you showing me ambient lighting at the top layer of the user experience, right? Or, or the home screen. So just boiling that all back down to just what do people use more often and creating systems and pathways that are simplified for what people do more often was really, was really the goal. Over the course of my career, there's been some major changes and shifts in technology, from giant bricks sitting on people's desks or under them that never were updated, to the evolution and dawn of laptops and mobile devices that were more frequently updated. I mean, even now you could wake up and there is an update for your phone that you have to suffer through that may bring the latest security patches or feature updates. Now, the thing is, the big difference between a mobile device and a car is vehicles carry far more weight, literally. And you have such a massive amount of technology that's baked into a car along with the safety issues. And this is something that was important to talk about with Toyota. Cars as a system are one of the most complicated products um, out there, right? When you think about it, they've got so much. And again, part of it has to be by nature, right? It's got to be a safe and secure mobility device, right? It's got to take you from A to B, be able to do it safely, be able to communicate to other drivers. You've got indicators, you've got horns. It's a lot more multifaceted than people really realize at the surface level, right? And that's the biggest difference into how you design software for a car versus a mobile device. Because you can make changes to a mobile device overnight because it's not a flying, you know, two-ton machine going down the highway, both, you know, the, the mechanical parts, the electric parts, the software parts, they all have to be as one, and there can be no element of failure. There, the safety factor is a whole different game compared to any sort of mobile or consumer device. Doesn't mean you can't take lessons learned from those segments, right? Don't just, one of the things that I think we, that I loved about our teams, right, is, is we didn't just look at the automotive industry, we really did philosophically look at 
how were problems like this tackled in the airline industry? How were problems like this tackled in consumer electronics? Innovation is always going to be easy at low volume or, or, or low numbers, right? It's just going to be easier to create vision and capability and new functionality and be able to deliver on it, right? There's not going to be that much of a dilution between vision and, and actual delivery. How do you create uh, an innovative, scalable process and development structure to where you can deploy to 10 million cars, to where you can create changes in design and also changes in uh, functionality dynamically um, to still be able to deliver at that scale. And that's been, I think, one of the bigger challenges within this development um, that perhaps at, at the surface level, you know, people will always ask questions is why, why hasn't Toyota done this before? Why can't Toyota do this? So it's a very difficult problem to fix. It's not something that's uh, inherently easy. If it was, you would have seen a lot more of it out there in the market, or we would have done it ourselves earlier. If, if I'm being 100% honest, at, at the very start, we, we didn't know how far we were going to go. We didn't know what we were going to create, um, and we didn't really have any concrete objectives. We, we got into a room on the whiteboard and we started sketching in an ideal situation, in an ideal world, what are the things that, we would, that, that a consumer would want in their vehicle? And so the, the teams came together, they, they, they built these mock-ups, they built these screens, we started reviewing them, and very quickly we started um, developing these on, on Sketch and, and getting them working on an iPad so that people could actually not only just see them, but they could start interacting with them. And it was really simple. Is this what we think customers would want? Now, one of the biggest debates in infotainment design is the use of physical controls versus touch. And when you get in the car, you might wonder, well, why did they do what they did? And you know, when it comes to, it's the divide of physical and digital. And we took that quite seriously. We knew it was a challenge going forward. Now, there are marked advantages that you get with making anything a, a soft button. That gives you the ability to update that thing over the year and change the look and change the feel. But again, that is also the, a, a physical knob or rotary device also has a lot of power in the sense that blind operation is completely it's completely possible. So, you know, when you're driving down the road to have the ability, you know, to do an HVAC, you know, temperature up, temperature down, uh, that's something that people enjoy and it kind of feel, gives you a connection to the, the, the device itself. And, you know, those choices are, are not always easy. And again, though some customers, I, you know, I read the reviews for our systems or other systems, some people absolutely love the full digital. Some people absolutely want everything back in buttons. It's our job to make the balance for all the customers. Uh, and you know we take that we take that task quite seriously, and we're not done yet. You know, as our customers' usage habits evolve and change, we absolutely are thinking about that even going into next generation vehicles. What is the right balance to strike there? So with, within automotive, I, I think there are a couple of different paths that OEMs are taking. Some are uh, very tactile and, and very traditional in the, the cockpit experience, and that, that can feel oftentimes cluttered. There's lots of knobs, lots of buttons, and there is some cognitive overload to what do all these things do? It's like when, when you walk into a, uh, an airplane and you, you glance into the cockpit as you're walking by, it, it feels very, very technical and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, intimidating. Then on the far other end of the spectrum, you've got uh, automakers that are entirely digital, that have moved to uh, only touch interfaces, icon iconography uh, with no labels that you're just supposed to uh, learn over time. And I, I, I think that the, the right spot is somewhere in the middle of those two. And uh, when, when I think about um, the, the usability of a system and things that are very fine grain in, in your adjustment. Volume is one of those. Temperature is probably one of those. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to me to have a, a tactile control that you don't need to look at that you can uh, kind of muscle memory make that change. Um, that does lock you into some design considerations, right? You're, you're, you're stuck with that 
method and that mechanism for those adjustments over time. Again, driving a car is taxing. It's, it's, it's not a easy thing to, to do. And so the more of those common repetitive muscle memory types of controls that we can add in, uh, I, I think the better. There are some controls that people may only use once a year or uh, at certain times of the year. I think these are really good candidates to move into a touch interface and, and move into more software driven interactions that can be more relevant to uh, the, the times when you may need those kinds of things. Think about, for example, uh, seat heating or cooling. It's pretty unlikely that you're going to be cooling your seat when it's cold outside. It's also very unlikely you're gonna be heating your seat when it's warm outside. So this is a contextual thing that I believe really lends itself towards uh, a digital interface. And it's up to the designers, the digital designers, to be thinking through how people need to be comforted while inside of a vehicle and uh, design for those experiences um, and, and really make something that is good digitally. I'll also say uh, this is a tough balance. It's a tough organizational challenge because you've, you've gotta be weighing out the cost savings of elimination of those physical, physical controls and uh, the, the customer burden of eliminating those physical controls. There are things that uh, financially would make more sense to do one way, but may have an impact on the customer. And as Toyota, we believe that given the, the choice between uh, financial benefit for the organization and customer benefit for the long time, we're gonna lean towards what's better for the customer. We had uh, about 300 customers over the uh, development cycle of this come in and challenge our assumptions every single week. And that, that requires kind of checking your ego at the door of, oh, I'm a good designer, I know what people want. Uh, it doesn't matter what I think people want if they don't actually want it. And so uh, we change directions a lot. We, we um, listened to what was, uh, what was working and did more of that. We listened to what was not working and tried and tried and tried again until we had something that, that was working better. And uh, I, I believe that the success of any product that we work on is directly correlated to the amount that we are talking to the customers that are gonna be using it. And that includes talking to existing Toyota customers, maybe more so talking to customers that used to own Toyota vehicles and, and abandoned the brand because we weren't listening to them enough, and talking to people who don't wanna buy a Toyota because of some, uh, some assumption that they have about what the technology will be. I wanna hear from all of those people. I wanna know uh, what's, what's in their mind and if I'm getting closer to something that uh, builds a product that they want to use. Before we began, you know, we, we did a lot of benchmarking. Any good designer or developer is gonna go look at what the competition is doing because there's easy lessons to be learned. Our point was that, hey, it, keeping it simple is best. So what we said is we experimented with a, a fixed menu system that says, hey, we're gonna have like a, a, at the time it was a horizontal fixed menu with all of the key options on it. We started testing that and our customers immediately came back in the testing and said, we don't like the reach to have to reach out all the way to the end to, to pick the, like the settings menu or, or, the, or the, uh, the music. So immediately they, the voice we heard is like, hey, why don't you have it closer to the driver and vertical? Um, we looked at that, we looked at the data and said, you know what? Yeah, we took the decision, let's make it vertical. We did it that way, we tested it. And then having it be persistent was one of the, was one of the big breakthroughs that, that that menu never got buried behind something else. So as you're going through the menu system, you know, you don't get to a point where, hey, I'm lost. I, I don't know how to get back to music or Navi. So these are the little things that we went through, but what we do is, you know, in our point, we don't want to get into the creative aspect of how a designer should develop a dash. Mm. What we simply say is here are the, we call them hard points. You know, these are the things that we would like to see from a what sunlight reflection point of view, from a reach point of view, um, you know, all those things and, and, and look down angles. We give them those things and say, here's your screen size. Here's all the hard points that we think are necessary for great human factors. Show us what you got.
You could ask 20 different designers across the world, what's the best way to do interior electronics? And you might get 20 different answers. However, there's gonna be a commonality now going forward because one of the key concerns about interior style or interior electronics is how do we keep it up to date? In the case of Toyota, that was something they had to figure out right at the ground floor is if they're going to make a connected system, do you want to have do you want to have things embedded, which means stored on the local car, stored at the local level, or do you want to have it accessed via cloud or over the network or things that are hybridized? So in the past, you had cars that had mapping software or just static information that never changed. You could have it 10 years. It's the same as when you bought it. And if you did have to do a map update, you had to purchase it online, get an SD card or take it to the dealership to update it. So these new generation systems are are looking to always have that network connectivity. So the things that they bake in from the factory that are static that's there, that again, takes up resources or space. And what do you run on the cloud, which means you have to connect to the internet to use, much like we do on our phones, like with mapping software. If you're using Google Maps, you're constantly going out to the network, constantly going out to Google to download maps, get updates, track traffic information. That's why Google Maps works so well. And that's the same concept here. What do you actually stream down versus store? And all of those have ramifications in terms of cost, memory, processing power, and all of that. Yeah, so, so I think a big challenge, right, anytime you go hybrid or or bridge the gap between cloud systems and embedded systems, right, is, is how do you get the two halves to marry themselves? Um, and I think that's something that this system strikes a really good balance with, right, is, is, is you know, perhaps mid-development. Um, we started having those discussions, and there were difficult discussions, right, amongst product teams and, and leadership of what's right to put where, right? Do you put, do you let this function run fully, on the cloud, you let it run fully on embedded. There's trade-offs to both, but at a certain point, you have to start looking at it as as what's best for the customer, and and a, what's best for the customer, but b also what works best from a scalability standpoint, and that's where a lot of the tougher decisions had to happen within this development. Right? Was is hey, we may not be able to do it how we originally thought of, but rip that bandit off early, rip it off now, test it, validate it, get it in front of people and get it in front of different perspectives because just because the, the lead designer or the lead engineer thinks it's, it's the right choice, they may be biased, it's their baby, it's their function. And so we really were able to distance emotion and remove the ego from design that often drives technology products because again, technology becomes the show of force. What can we do? Do you really need all that compute power? If end of the day, I'm just trying to go grab a coffee and listen to my favorite playlist, Processing and memory, very expensive, big investments. Uh, the the growth or evolution of hardware is exp it, it just it, we can't keep up. So by putting a, a lot of these functions and capabilities into the cloud, we're actually helping to to future proof our product because we're not committed to everything on board. And that's why navigation, voice, a lot of our key functions or services historically were embedded are now being pushed to the cloud is for that point, is to make sure that um, we, we can continue to scale and, and keep up to date uh, with market. The philosophy around the, the connected vehicle and the connected ecosystem to me is, is kind of simple. If it doesn't benefit the customer in any way, then we shouldn't do it. So that, that's the overarching philosophy. Then if you step back down, um, you come back to, well now, because it is a connected ecosystem, it's, a, it's really important that we've got to choose the right partners and the right solutions to make sure that the system is working 24 by 7, 365 days a, a year. So that, it, and, and that may seem simple, but it's actually very complicated. If you think about it, you've got the, the vehicle itself and the, the software and the electronics in the vehicle. You've then got the carrier connection then you've got your cloud systems. Um, so who, which vendor you use for cloud? Um, and then on top of that, you've got your applications that, that are running. Um, and then of course, you've got the customer's mobile phone, which has its own data connection. So if you think of that total end-to-end -end ecosystem, there were a huge points of fault where things could go wrong. Then you step down and say, that means that this has to work seamlessly, has to work really well, has to be responsive. So then we come back down to, okay, so now who are our partners? So I'll, I'll give you an example. When it comes to the, the, the cloud provider, you know, we, we decided early on to work with AWS. Um, the reason for working with AWS for a lot of our stuff was um, 
because of their high availability, the, the resources that were available to us as we were building our applications. Um, and so th that, that was a huge, a huge reason for one of our decisions. Um, saying that, we do have some other solutions where we use Microsoft and Microsoft Azure for some of our other connected products. So being cloud agnostic actually is very important to me. It allows us to not only evaluate the different solutions that are out there, but also pivot if we need to in certain circumstances. Philosophically, though, the traditional development of multimedia in the past has been that for Toyota, we want our hand in all the, in quality um, beginning to end. So we, we created our own maps or we sourced our own maps. Um, the points of interest, we've actually went, hired third party to go and drive uh, for the most part to verify that the POIs were there, still there, relevant, on, open. It, the point here is the whole, do we buy it or, or make it uh, came into question. And, and a lot of our partners, and that became where partnership came into play, is for search, we didn't want to make our own search engine. We didn't want to go and, and, and be another Google. So we partnered with Google. We, for, for Maps, we did the same thing. The point is that we, we didn't lose any of our DNA or quality. It's just we, we've taken um, um, proven partners that are reliable and trusted and, and we've applied it or integrated that to multimedia. So that actually saved um, a significant amount of cost and investment in order for us to then reapply that to, to other parts of the uh, hardware. Now that you have a better understanding of why you would want cloud-based infrastructure and network connectivity from the car to those systems, there are also other factors to this. There is the product improvement, there is the product updates and security patches, but there is also the factor of network security, privacy, and security issues going forward. So uh, let me start explaining what, what cloud is with respect to automotive terms, all right? why we use cloud, right? So cloud in general is, is, a, is a big term that you know, many people use, but for the relevance of what features that we offer to our customers, Cloud really gives us a way to centralize the features that we put together as a platform, uh, and, and it exists out there that it can easily integrate and interact with so many other partner systems or functions that we actually pull from and offer a consolidated experience to our customer. As an example, uh, we are talking about music services from, let's say, Apple Music or Amazon, right? We are talking about uh, um, uh, diagnostic uh, data processing uh, capability that some of these cloud providers uh, give us uh, ability to process that data a lot more efficiently. Uh, the uh, non-functional aspects of it, which is uh, making the system very highly available, highly scalable when a uh, system has to meet the demands of uh, load and, and hence process the data in a lot more exponential manner that uh, the cloud gives us the capability to be able to configure, scale, and run that very, uh, very easily, very optimally, right? So there are definitely many benefits of why we use cloud. Now, uh, where we use cloud uh, with respect to connected uh, services is like all of our core platform features, functions that vehicles connect to and interact with sits in a centralized cloud infrastructure that it's very, it becomes very easy for vehicles, irrespective of which geography the vehicle is, that it's trying to connect to and, and run, can run very easily uh, by the centralized location being cloud that is catering these services to these vehicles, to these customers, right? So geography is, is not a problem. And then the data that we collect uh, primarily is vehicle data, the customer using that vehicle uh, and the features that they are consuming data with respect to that so that we can understand the customer's usage, customer's preferences, and then we can offer these services back to that customer in a very tailored fashion. So uh, we, that is primarily the context of what data we collect from the vehicle for that customer, and that's sent to cloud. The subscription services that uh, customer gets, right, includes something uh, that is pivotal to it called user profile, right? So user profile basically takes you as a customer, ties it with the vehicle type that you're getting a subscription for, and it starts creating a profile, like your, for instance, as th things as simple as your music profile, right? So let's say you have Apple Music, Amazon Music, it takes those and then 
ties it with your profile, right? It takes your vehicle and the features that the vehicle comes with, and it can have some preference settings that, that you would typically get into the car and do initially, and it can save that into the profile, right? Over a period of time, it's building your profile per se. And, and then when you go, uh, let's say, travel somewhere and you're you know, taking a rental car, happens to be a Toyota, then this profile, when you take your phone along with you and, and get in the car and pair up your phone with the car, that profile can then sync up with the car. Hence, the car that you're using at that point in time can have these same preferences, same settings that you can then use in that car that you're renting for the period of time. OTA in general, right? So what, what does it do? It basically gives uh, us the flexibility, ability to send a software patch or an update to a particular uh, module in the car, uh, which, which of course runs software. So it could be a feature enhancement, it could be a fix to some you know, known issue, things along those lines, right? But we have, again, through this platform that we have built, centralized capability to understand what cars, hence what devices in those cars have what version of software. And then if we need to patch or update, we can uh, build the package, have it quality verified, and then push it to those respective cars that needs to take that software version upgrade. And of course, customer has to consent for taking that upgrade at that point in time. And then once they do, the software downloads, it updates, and hence the customer now has the latest piece of software, which either fixes an issue or it adds continually uh, improved capability that the customers can enjoy and experience. So when it comes to security, our, I think our philosophy really was, was to look at it end to end and also bring it up front. If we're building such a connected system and platform, um, data privacy, data security has to be taken into design consideration right from the start. I think a lot of folks look at it right as, as, as the, the meat and potatoes versus the vegetables. Nobody wants to eat the vegetables of security and data privacy. But for Toyota, it's so instrumental to make sure our customers um, have that sense of safety and security knowing um, we're only using your data to make the product better. End of story. There's nothing else to it. We've even spent a lot of time to create the items such as our data privacy portal to take that legal ease and make it tangible, make it easy to understand um, right up front. The minute you start using our products and services, you're going to see it, you're going to understand it, and you're going to know this is what we're doing with it and why. So, so once this data I I is stored, uh, of, uh, there are some standard uh, practices that apply in terms of protecting the data, right? So at rest encryption practices, even while we connect and retrieve the data, how do we do that uh, within uh, sec secure mechanisms, right? So that primarily involves uh, some connectivity-related uh, security uh, uh, realms that we create uh, using our uh, carrier network that we bring that data securely. And, and then once we store, uh, the data is encrypted. And in order to make this highly available, uh, we actually replicate that this data across uh, two different uh, AWS uh, regions uh, with which we are able to achieve that uh, high availability, right? Uh, in terms of retaining this data, so it's predominantly defined by a few different boundaries, right? Uh, first one is when customer consents for a service, that is the starting point of when we collect the data, right? And, and let's say that uh, really happens when customer purchases the vehicle or if customer sells the vehicle to a second owner, the data that just does not transfer from the first owner to the second owner, there's a line of boundary drawn where the new owner's data collection starts happening the day they start owning and registering for their services, right? So we have some of those clear demarcations to make sure that the data doesn't mix up between a different customers or different uh, boundaries, if you will, right? So then once we have that data, uh, it is for the period of the subscription and any uh, regulatory requirements that we are required to keep this data, right? Typically, any data that doesn't meet any of these requirements, we keep it for as little as a couple of weeks to maybe max 30 days, after which the data is like uh, taken out, right? So we, we do do this from time to time for uh, evaluating the usage and understanding the performance of the application to see if we need to uh, 
diagnose root cause any issues and you know resolve any issues uh, from that standpoint for, for these are the reasons why we store this uh, data in a temporary fashion but that then it goes away but uh, typically for a subscription based service it is for the start or date when the subscription activates to uh, as long as the customer wants to keep that uh, data is really defined by that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of news out there about collecting data and data collection and tracking vehicles um, one of the things I want to make clear that your audience understands is that from a Toyota perspective and from my perspective um, we are again 100% focused on customer first and we want to be as transparent as possible to our customers. We have a data privacy portal where I think we're the first in the industry to have that where we explain to customers how we're collecting your data, why we're collecting your data and giving customers the ability to switch off those functions. What I don't want to do is collect customers' data and sell it to make money for Toyota. That is no benefit to the customer and honestly it's not what where our interest lies um, from a group. What's important to me is if we're collecting data, number one, inform the customer. Make sure that the opt-ins, when the customer opts in and registers, that they're very clear, very concise. Hey, we're collecting your data, so if you're in an accident, we can send, we can track your vehicle and we can send emergency vehicles to your location. We're collecting your data so that we can run models on how you drive, so we can provide you better insurance that will help you save money, um, and so forth. Now, at any one of those steps, if a customer doesn't want us to track their driving behavior and is not interested in saving money on insurance, switch it off. And then we want, we want to track the data, we want to use it, we want to sell it. That, I think, is what customers want, and they want that transparency um, and visibility that I believe other OEMs are not doing. Now, from my opportunity to go to Toyota headquarters in North America, I've been able to talk to engineers, designers, the business leaders behind this, and this is the first car company that was willing to be transparent about user privacy, security, how things are designed, and they've been very honest about the fact that they're still figuring things out. This is going to be a constant evolution. It's challenging. Now, even working in this industry, I was completely blown away at the level of detail that they have to go into, not only to protect user data, but to protect the hardware. So for example, there was a lab, lab dedicated just to network security professionals that are doing ethical hacking, trying to hack into databases, trying to connect over the internet, trying to connect over a LAN, to hack into these systems, to exploit user data, to see what they can get into, to try to stay ahead of the curve. You have teams that are constantly working at and trying to figure out backdoor security flaws and how to patch out potential issues. But it doesn't stop there just with the software and the network connectivity. It's the hardware. Because once the car leaves the factory, that means somebody can buy this, pull out the guts, and take apart the boards at a chipset level and try to exploit the chips, remove chips and replace them, and do all the crazy stuff that you would never consider doing to try to exploit data or change code that potentially could get access to databases or user information or proprietary secrets. So they're literally taking about part boards inside Toyota to try to rewire and figure out potential exploits. It's not just that either. It's not every chip is made by Toyota. They have partners. They have other OEMs and suppliers that have to follow strict standards. But even when those production-ready boards come out, they still have to take apart production boards from suppliers to make sure that those suppliers are following through on all of the specifications to make sure nothing was changed or altered. So this is the ongoing problem and difficulty with creating systems like this that you constantly have to have the know-how the resources and the money to play in this field. Yeah, um, I often get actually asked that question. Why, why, why are we spending our time doing this? Why are we building these technology solutions? In a way, for me, it's really easy. Um, the, the first thing is customer safety is paramount in our vehicles. And I think nothing is safer than stopping customers looking at their mobile phones or using their mobile phones when they're in the vehicle. That is a big passion of mine. I think if we can stop that, we can um, make our vehicles around the world so much safer. And I think technology is the solution to prevent that. So by taking control of this environment, taking control of the technology in the cockpit, we have an ability and have an, an opportunity to provide what the customer wants in a way that is very unique to the way when you're driving a vehicle. And I think that is what, what 
make differentiates us from the Apples or the Googles or the other tech companies in the world. Yes, they're very good at what they do and they are very hyper-focused on your mobile phone, but I don't believe that they are as hyper-focused um, on the vehicles as they are on their own devices. And I think that is where we should, we do excel and I think that's where we should excel in the future. Now you could easily make the argument that this company is doing it better than that one, or we have this figured out, or we have, we have a better screen or more processing power. That argument's gonna continue to go on. What should we embed in the car versus on the cloud? And we're basically, it, this is all in its infancy. So we're in gen one really of all of this right now. In the case of Toyota, they have designed this really for one thing, and that, that's to try to improve the customer experience, to figure out what the customer wants. And a lot of having access to a network or cloud-based infrastructure where they can send this data and store it is finding out what you're doing in the car. And that sounds scary, but really when you look at it from the engineering side, they can see what you're doing and what you're not doing, where you're tapping on the screen, where you're back and forth in and out of menus constantly trying to get to one place. They can see that. They can also see what you're not using. If they have five engineers constantly coding and updating a, P a module for the infotainment or the software that nobody's ever using, they know maybe we should put our resources somewhere else. And that's how these products improve, and that's really the future of them, much like phones. Now, there's even another layer to that, the future layer, and this is where we talk to Microsoft about connected cars. And Tim Carroll, which is the head of HPC, or High Performance Compute, he shed some light on the potential of connected cars outside, just not just one, but we're talking millions of cars. So connected cars are an exciting topic for me personally. As a person who spent the last 20 years trying to figure out ways to get more compute into the hands of the researchers who needed it. The concept of connected cars provi provides all sorts of opportunities for us. Because remember, connected means connecting two people or two things. So not only do we have the resources within Azure to be able to provide compute and data services to people or vehicles that we may not have been able to before because of the cloud connection, but more importantly, because of the data that's being collected, not by a million researchers, but by 50 million vehicles on the road, think of the value that data can provide to both companies and governments in terms of turning that into something actionable. So a forecast, for example, our ability to forecast what a weather condition is gonna be is impacted directly by the data that's coming in. So if we know the road conditions down to the block and the time, we have the ability to put action on that data for not only first responders, but for commercial vehicles in the area. And the, the concepts like that are incalculable as you start understanding that as soon as we provide the connection between ground truth and the ability to act on it, we are now open to any sort of solution that we think would have value. Now, if you're feeling the pressure in your head, the vice clamping down from hearing all of this technical talk, it goes well beyond this because it's not just about the automotive world that is dabbling in this. Most of our world's infrastructure and biggest services have now moved to cloud-based computing. And it's not just storage, it's not just network, it's actual computing power. And this was part of our discussion with Microsoft involving HPC or high performance computing, something that they're really focused on. And if you wanna learn, about really what's involved in the future, not only for researchers, medical community, the scientific community, government agencies, cars. This is the type of infrastructure that they're go going to be leveraging and using at a massive scale. This is the future of supercomputing. So if you wanna watch and learn about HPC, please watch our video or watch Microsoft's video on what that, what that involves and all the details. Now, when we strip this back and we get back to the automotive world, there's still physical hardware that is in consumers' hands for a long time. You might have your Toyota for five years, you might have it for 20 years. And that's something that Toyota is really strict on with suppliers, making sure that these parts have availability. And that's something that I was able to talk to the chief engineer about. I know this, I started in the service side. So I guess that's for me, I started back and worked my way forward. At the back, I understood every customer had a complaint, they didn't like their product. Cause I was on the service side, never, they're never happy. 
my job was, okay, why did I, what did I sign up for Toyota for? Everybody complains to me every day, right? How do I make their lives better? And so from there to now go to design, I can affect their customer experience in a vehicle because I'm responsible for design. So by having that full circle of not only the customer at the end of the call or at the service garage where a technician needs help to manufacturing, did assembly have to do with some of these challenges for making that part so expensive or so expensive to replace? Right? It, it's those kind of things, and down to planning, cost planning, now to overall design as chief engineer. I, I, I think my, the base I have, or the, the foundation, when you say, how do you know? I know, because I've been in every department. We, we do support solid 10 years of product. So if, if, like you're saying, if the supply chain were to go away, they're, they're not making chips anymore. They're not making a tape deck anymore. That's where we activate the refurbish program uh, to, to go back and, and or reman. Uh, and we also look at cost of ownership. So all of these factors come in. So I'm not saying that this product would immediately go to reman or immediately go in this way. But we, we do, when we go through sourcing, is make sure from our supplier base point of view, they understand when they work with Toyota that they're committing a 10-year cycle uh, for multimedia. So this Tundra and that screen you're seeing today, will that be there or be, 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 be available at the service or parts center? Absolutely it will one way or another. Would it be new? Maybe not. Would it be new stock? It would absolutely be one way or another customer should be, will have access to replacing that um, multimedia 10 years from now. Absolutely. You can go 10 years back today. Look at what model was, you know, let's, let's say it's a 2011, 2010 RX. Can you get a screen? Absolutely. It's got a tape deck in it, <laughs> but you can still get it. Our suppliers get really angry about that though, because they're like, hey, come on, it's it's like a phone, it's, it's out, and after six months you're done. We're like, no. And, and that, that's how sourcing happens, is why did you pick this supplier A versus B when B is a lot cheaper or B is a lot more known and it's in the market today? Why not? Well, it's because they, they just don't have that depth or that longevity that we're expecting them to have. So we're not making disposable products. We, we never have, never will. Like many of our fine print videos, there is so much to digest in terms of information, and I realize this is not the easiest topic to, to grasp and understand. In fact, you could take each topic in this video and spin off an additional one hour video on each one, and it probably still would not be enough. But it's hyper relevant for me, enough to spend three months of my life making this video, and to try to tell the story, at least the foundation, so people now and in the future can understand everything that's going into modern car technology. Over the next five to 20 years, you're gonna see every new car connected to the internet, which is gonna raise concerns about user privacy, user security, cloud-based com computing infrastructure and the security that goes into that. And of course, all the technology that you're jamming in a car. Now, yes, this story is largely skewed towards what Toyota's experience was and their mentality behind creating all of the software, all the hardware, and all the security that goes along with it. But what's universal is whether you're talking to Mercedes, BMW, Kia, and Hyundai, they're all going to have the same kind of back end going on. They're going to have some type of cloud solutions provider. They're going to have a network security layer and all the software that goes along with that. The difference might be in the user experience, how each company views what's important to them. Some want a huge graphical experience where there's 3D models moving along and, and augmented reality and holographics, I'm sure. And you're going to need a ton of compute power. And on the other side, you have Toyota, where it's a little bit more conservative about let's keep it simple. Regardless of how the manufacturer does it, a lot of that back end technology is going to be evolving and evolving and changing. But at least now we have an understanding with the help of Toyota and their engineers and all the people that I've been able to work with and see behind the scenes to, to kind of understand what the hell is going on. And that's really what this video is about. So in the future, I hope to cover more of these topics individually and with Microsoft, with the help of Toyota and maybe even some other manufacturers. And hopefully we can bring more information to the table. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.